We are uh, on the second Sunday of Advent, and it is not certainly lost upon any of us. I believe that we are aware of all that is happening in the world. On the second Sunday of Advent, historically all across the world, we have a certain kind of particular pra practice in the Advent, uh, the Advent uh, season to do a, a number of things. Now, obviously, uh, many of us uh, who've grown up in the Protestant church uh, may not necessarily participate, particularly in our black churches, in our African-American church traditions, in Advent as a practice. Uh, but it is a part of the global church, and we are, for good or for bad, a part of the global church. And so four Sundays during the season of Advent are usually underscoring uh, four themes. The first Sunday is a theme of hope. The second Sunday is a theme of peace. The third Sunday is the theme of joy. And the fourth Sunday is the theme of love. Advent four Sundays leading up to Christmas that provide an opportunity for those who follow Jesus, those who are part of the tradition that has emerged of, from the life of Jesus, that we commit ourselves, we prepare ourselves as it were, for the coming of the Lord. And so uh, on today uh, and next week and the week thereafter, a number of our churches across the country are uh, deciding to stand in solidarity uh, with uh, a number of our church friends and comrades and colleagues in the land of Palestine because of the uh, ongoing war, conflict, genocide, whichever word you want to use, it is a tragedy of epic proportions. The number of civilian lives that have been lost uh, in the last six weeks dwarfs any other conflict in our time, or at least in our lifetime. Obviously, there have been other genocides and mass killings, uh, but there have been in this time, in this last several weeks or so, last several months, uh, an armed conflict that our tax dollars, by the tune of some billions of dollars, are helping to extend. Uh, I was reading the Washington Post this morning uh, that uh, uh, a memo from the State Department said that if the United States were not continuing to provide bombs and resources to the nation of Israel, that they would be forced to stop their bombardment weeks ago. What do you think about that, All right? Regardless of what you or me or we think about uh, the, the right to self-defense or however ways we twist ourselves up in pretzels to make uh, a moral excuse for uh, immoral activity, the reality is that if we, your tax dollars, my tax dollars, were not being used to provide weapons to another country, they would not be able to continue to do this. And so uh, there is, among the religious, interreligious, interfaith communities all across the country, Jews, Muslims, Christians, people of other faiths and people of no faith who are calling and crying out to our government to push for a ceasefire using our ability to influence um, the nation of Israel and surrounding partners. And we continue to, as a nation, be on the wrong side of a ceasefire. Uh, just at the United Nations uh, yesterday, I believe, there was another uh, no vote by the United States to literally kill the idea of a ceasefire from the United Nations, which would have forced the United Nations to bring in peacekeepers from other countries, including our own, to try and create spaces for peace and humanitarian assistance. And so not only are we providing money from our own tax dollars, but we are also blocking other countries through an international response to provide some spaces for peace. 
We need not embrace Hamas or any of these other militarized groups in order to say that we are calling for a ceasefire. We ought to just say we are following the Prince of Peace. And we are asking for a ceasefire. And so today, a number of us are lighting the, a candle for uh, peace in the name of Advent Sunday, calling for a ceasefire. And this candle is burning for peace. Next Sunday, we're going to invite all of us who are willing and able to bring your own candle. And we are going to, at the conclusion of our service, or perhaps during our service, gather outside as a public expression of a call for peace in a time of genocidal wars. And uh, I will say that there were a few of us who were contemplating on calling for the church to just cancel Christmas in America altogether. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why? Because... Similar calls in Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus, which today is under brutal military occupation. They have had to call themselves to cancel Christmas. What do you think about that? We are celebrating Christmas in every part of the world in 2023 except for Bethlehem. Because it is not safe for them to publicly celebrate Christmas. Christians, Muslims, Palestinians, Arabs, Africans, other groups who live in the Holy Land with all kinds of human rights and civil liberties withheld from them are literally being left vulnerable to the whims of what some of us would describe as a rogue militarized government. And due to safety concerns, a Bethlehem pastor has canceled Christmas in his own church and the surrounding communities. Now, I know I just said some of us are suggesting canceling Christmas here, and y'all start moving around, all got quiet, I didn't hear amen. <laughs> Canceling Christmas for many of us feels like a non-starter, an extreme woke response. Everybody, you know, too woke. It's a too woke response for tragic current events, but I do wonder how many of us are willing to interrogate what kind of Christmas do we need? Amidst the rubble of our current events, what kind of Christmas do we need? Amidst the rubble of our own lives, what kind of Christmas do you need? Because quiet as that is kept, there's a lot of rubble here in America that is burying many of us. Rubble of economic pressures. Rubble of broken and fractured relationships. Rubble of desperation and irrational anger, fear, and pain, rubble of political violence, and wicked governance here in Berserkly, here in the county, here in Oakland, in Richmond, in San Francisco. We're being buried under the rubble of all kinds of disappointments and unmet expectations. Some of us know folk, because we certainly wouldn't admit a church it's us today, who are being buried under the rubble of loneliness, isolation, depression. And so while you may not be willing to entertain the canceling of Christmas broadly, I do wonder, is there a traditional Western capitalistic unattached Christmas season you are willing to cancel? Are you willing to ask yourself, what kind of Christmas do I need? What kind of Christmas do we need? I believe the text helps us this morning. This is the lectionary passage, Isaiah chapter number 61. It is a, a wonderful passage. It is not unfamiliar. <clears throat> Give me a little more monitors on this, please. It is not unfamiliar to us. 
as it relates to the, the call of God on the willing. And I say the willing purposefully because often Isaiah 61 is, is uniquely attributed to uh, uh, the prophet Isaiah and then to Jesus who literally opened up the scroll in Luke chapter number four and read these words and closed the book and said, this is referring to me. But I want you to appreciate that there are, through scholarly kind of reflection and research, three parts of Isaiah. You have Isaiah 1 through 39. It's called the Proto-Isaiah, which contains the original words of the prophet Isaiah, a major prophet, a living, breathing, real prophet to the people of Israel, reminding them of their covenant responsibility, trying to help them make sense of life in exile. Then you had the Deutero Isaiah, which is the work of an anonymous, exilic author, someone who was writing during exile, trying to help them make the connection and keep the tradition alive. And then you got the Trito Isaiah. It's three Isaiahs. Mm -hmm. An anthology of about 12 passages. What I, 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 I wanted to highlight that because what is so important about the book of Isaiah and many prophetic acts is that they often are in our tradition essentialized into one prophet, one person, one individual, which makes some people think that, you know, that is just the work of them over there to do. But in reality, the collection of the prophetic work in the text is often written and inspired and done through ordinary people like us. Did you catch that? The work of God boldly proclaiming God's revealed wisdom and activity to the world is not done by a special group of people. It's usually done through regular, ordinary people like us. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I got some profit in me. Come on, say that. I, I got some profit in me. And because there's some profit in you, I want you now to hear Isaiah 61, not as something for the special anointed folk out there. But if we're talking about what kind of Christmas do we need, I want you to hear it as perhaps something that's just for you. And this is what the scripture says. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion. Mm. Lord, this is this, this some good stuff. To give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I got some profit in me. I got some profit. The, they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display God's glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. And so I'm going to preach for about 20 minutes or so. A simple topic that just says the Christmas we need. Father, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give your neighbor a quick high five and tell him this is the Christmas we need. This is The lighting of this peace candle is an acknowledgement. It is a, dare I say, invitation. 
for all of us to ask ourselves, are we people of peace? I light this candle, I lit this candle, I preach even this message on Advent Sunday, acknowledging that we do not have peace domestically here at home, nor do we have peace abroad. That we live in a culture and a world characterized by violence and death, systemically, interpersonally, politically, economically, relationally. That our response to wrong and or to disorder is not without violence. Never forget the moments whereby violence happens in our communities and it is then weaponized to get all of our collective support for a violent counter to acts of violence. It is as if we are trying to put out fire with gasoline, wondering why it is the fire grows rather than diminishes. It is this kind of ubiquitous nature of violence that becomes concrete in tragic shooting. The ubiquitous nature of violence becomes concrete through genocides. The, 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 the sensibility of violence that we are surrounded by, that we are often unfamiliar it's happening to us or unaware that it's happening to us, it becomes concrete through domestic violence, intimate partner violence, wars, terror attacks, and all of these concrete acts of violence, they shock our conscience. And we get shook. Oh my God, clutch our pearls. Oh my, why is it so violent? Not fully appreciating that the culture of our country is one of violence. Now, lest you think this is true everywhere, you know, I was in uh, Portugal uh, for a week and, and I was there, one of our former members, Alana, and another member, Asha, a few folks, they moved into Portugal and, you know, I, I, I fell in love with Portugal when I got there on a the layover. I was on my way, to, my first trip to Israel, Palestine, and, and, and I laid over it for 30 hours and I was like, man, I could live in Lisbon. <laughs> you got this Bay Bridge just like ours, man, and a lot of diversity, and, 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 and the more I learned about Lisbon, do you know that they don't really have crime? I mean, folks just walk around, and there ain't nobody shooting and stabbing and bipping, and, and it, it was, you know, you got, can't got to keep your head on a swivel. You know, I was walking around my, uh, you know, Bay Area mean mug on, like, man, don't, don't, don't be do it. Don't try it. <laughs> and it's like, they ain't even trying. It's like, I'm the one that's, this, this precondition. <laughs> mm. And it caused me to think about why am I, as a follower of Jesus, still so conditioned to violence? It is likely because we are raised in a culture of violence unbeknownst to us. And yet we are called to be people of peace as followers of Jesus. Peace in our own lives. Peace in our relationships. Peace in our politics. Peace in our theology. Peace in our communities. Peace in our interactions. Peace in our churches. Peace among our religions. What is it about our formation and discipleship as Christians in America that we can't be people of peace. It is quite an indictment on what it means to follow Jesus, I think. That you can follow Jesus and still be a warmongerer. I mean, I work with, you know, Pookie and Ray Ray and them, and, you know, a lot of them feel like, you know, Man, me and God, we got this, you know, understanding. Well, really, what's, what's you and God's understanding, you know? Um, I mean, you know, it's between me and God. So, okay. Was well, God telling you to, like, shoot this brother from East Oakland? It's like, well, we got an understanding. 
began to ask myself, what kind of understanding has been introduced to our children, to us, where we don't feel the taking of another life or the brutalization of another body or the marginalization of a people is commensurate with following Jesus. Now, I got to say that we are not timeless or unbound Christians in the tradition of our religious practice. The Christian church throughout history, particularly in Europe, persecuted and killed Jews, Muslims, and even other Christians at times. I mean, some of the fuel that fuels fundamentalist political ideologies like Zionism or or, or other uh, uh, religious, nationalistic, Christo-fascic uh, contemporaries is because sometimes people get power and mix their religion with political power. And rather than just be boldly political, they will say, I'm actually doing this because I'm a faithful follower of my religion. But how many of you know that a God that needs you to kill somebody in order for you to stay in power is a kind of small God? Think about this. The creator of everything needs you. <laughs> right? Like God is controlling everything. The earth, the land, the sea, the stars. And God needs you to go out here and force somebody else to do something that God seems to want them to do, but God can't get them to do it, but God get everything else to do whatever God wants them to do. Now, that's not nothing to do with God. That has to do with us mixing a toxic, deadly synchronism between religious and imperialistic domination. As Christians, we must sit and wrestle with that history. Because all through all this persecution of Jews and Muslims and other Christians, guess what was celebrated every year through all those seasons? Christmas. So it makes me ask the question, what kind of Christmas do we need to help put an interruption to the endless wars and domination that often have too many so-called Christians signing up for it. Because I got news for you. God has no pleasure in the death of anyone. That's what the prophet says. Rather, God wants them to turn and live. So our posture then must be a posture to help articulate why we must be people of peace. There's a, there's a religious uh, practicality or faithfulness to that. But let me also give you just a straight up uh, 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 all you who are patriots in here, I'm not a patriot. I tell you all the time, you know, uh, I don't see God bless America. Because I don't think God cares anything about America. I think God cares about the world. That's what scripture says. For God so, it didn't say, for God so loved America. At least that, my Bible didn't say that. Maybe they got a new one out because, you know, they're they doing weird things these days. They're going to have a Trump Bible after a while, right? He's going to exchange everything for his name and the USA. And, but, 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 you know, the one that we was raised on, it said, for God so loved the world. So there is a necessary struggle that we must have as people of peace to appreciate that we are being asked to live in a Violent world very differently. But I love how President Eisenhower, in April of 19, now that says 2023, but that can't be right, or he'd still be alive today. I want to say it was April of 19, 40, 33, maybe 70, it was April of one of them threes. But this is what he said. <laughs> every gun that is made, every warship launched, 
Every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed. Those who are cold and not clothed. This is a president of the United, they don't make presidents like this no more. And you know, he was saying this even back then while we was all segregated. Somebody say, man, they're still lynching us, but at least he was on, he was on the, right, the right road. This world in arms is not spending money alone. I want you to hear this, because this is the cost of the war economy on all of us. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 population. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete pavement. We pay for a single fighter with a half million bushels of wheat. Which think all these unhoused loved ones, all this food insecurity. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. Listen, this is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. I want you to appreciate, beloved, that aside from the genocide happening in Gaza, aside from the tragedy in Sudan and the Congo and Yemen and, and other parts of Haiti and, and the world, you and I must appreciate that there is a cost to not be people of peace. We serve our own genius up in the service of something that God invites us to literally stand against. And this season, this time, then invites you and I to say, I will not participate in a project or a season that gives moral cover for the destruction of that which God created. Mm -hmm. Rather, if we must celebrate Christmas, I don't know. I'm going to keep praying on that. What kind of Christmas do we need? Well, I'm going to give you three quick things, and then I got to run to the airport and catch a flight. <laughs> Real talk. One of my comrades was killed in his home a couple weeks ago. And this first point is in his honor, but it comes from the text. His name was Michael Latt. He was killed in his home. Someone broke into his home and shot him in his home. 33 years old, a Jewish young man, worked with us to cultivate and curate events all across the country around ending mass incarceration, violence, and racism. And so this first point, coming from the text, is in his not honor because his organization's name was Lead with Love. And so on Advent Sunday, I want to say that the way... You and I get the Christmas we need is, as the scripture says, remind ourselves that the Lord God has anointed you to bring good news. What is the good news? Lead with peace and love. We need a Christmas today that causes you and I to lead with peace, to lead with love. Somebody holler, lead with peace. Say, lead with love. And this is what I love about this idea of what it means to be a people of peace. Uh, Dr. Donna, Pastor Donna, she preached here uh, many times, obviously, but there was one nugget that came to my mind, uh, and she said it like this, that making peace is very different than keeping the peace. How I many I remember when she said that? I mean, that thing bothered me. As you can tell, I'm still wrestling with it. Because <laughs> some of us, by the way we're formed, we're used to just keeping the peace. Oh, we just going to, you know, maintain the status quo. Ain't going to rock no boats. I'm just going to be one of these go along, get along people. Because surely I got to just keep the peace. But how many of you know there's too much conflict and tension 
in your life, in the life of your family, in the life of your relationships, in the life of your children, in the life of our communities, for us to just keep the peace when we are actually being called to help make peace. Which means how do you and I help lean into the tension and the conflict that we are surrounded by, the ubiquitous nature of violence, of death, some of us on our jobs work in communities where we're surrounded by tension and conflict. Your job is not just to continue to maintain the status quo. Your job is to lean in and help make peace. How do you help make peace? Well, some of us need to go get some lessons. Conflict resolution is called. Hello, somebody. Because some of our tools are the reason why we only got tension. In conflict. Anybody ever been in a relationship or in proximity to somebody and they just think that they're helping and they are not? Every word they say, the thing just gets wounds. Like, no, that's not helping. Oh, yeah, watch. Boom. And by the end, you're like, man, if you were not here, this whole situation would have de escalated. Well, how many of you know that part of what it means to lead with peace and love is you and I in a World where we have been literally formed by violence, we have to learn a new language, a new set of practices, de-escalation, conflict resolution. I know these are nice, you know, uh, DEI words or nice words. Be like, oh, pastor, I came to hear about Jesus. Well, Jesus, I'm here to tell you now, wants you to learn how to de-escalate some things. You are not curse at people. When you in a heated conversation that you're trying to de-escalate. You ought not walk around with a pistol in your hand. When you in front of someone that you know has bad feelings towards you. That's not de-escalation. You ought not be on your job. Mm -hmm. Stirring a pot. Knowing that this pot stirring is about to get you and them fired. <laughs> De-escalation. There is a need for some of us to lead with peace and love. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. It does not uphold evil. Love stands against it with a certain kind of forceful uh, 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 James Foreman and, 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 and some of our heroes, they called it militaristic principle nonviolent resistance. I said, my God, I want some of that. <laughs> How much we need to learn a new way of making peace. And here's the question I have. Are you more committed to maintaining the peace of the status quo than making peace among the tension and the conflict? In your own relationships, are you more committed to working through the tough? I got, I got a massage and things while I was away, and I had a big knot right on the back. Right, I mean, I had knots. It was everywhere, stress everywhere. And, 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 the, and the masseuse lady, she was like, sir, what do you do for work? <laughs> this is, what is this? I said, don't ask no questions. I'm not paying you to be my psychologist. <laughs> Work out them knots. And I'm telling you, it took days of consistent needing and pressing. Where now, you know, I only got one side that needs some work. <laughs> but working through all that tension and conflict, it was hard. It was painful. I hollered out. It wasn't just a wonderful experience. I'm trying to tell you what it means to work through tension. Because some of us would maintain the status quo because it's too difficult to work through the tension of making peace. But when there's injustice, when there's genocidal violence happening, when there's violence among your family members, when there's abuse, when there's uh, misuse happening, you can't just turn your eye 
Because it's easier to just keep the peace when you are being asked to lean in a little bit. Lord, have mercy. I'm a long-winded preacher on the day. I got to catch a flight. Did y'all get them questions? Why does our discipleship fail to form us as people of peace? I want you to wrestle with that because I'm wrestling with it. I don't think there's a failure in the gospel. I think there's a failure in our discipleship. I hope you understand what I'm saying. The message is not the problem. It's the formation. It's the teachers. It's those who are, dis- and we are supposed to be discipling, making disciples of Jesus all across the world. How is it the people that we're discipling seem to love violence? Maybe because they're being discipled in the wrong way. Second way that we get the Christmas we need, it's going to be hard. Pay attention to the rubble. Pay attention to the rubble. The scripture says that they will be called to build the devastated cities. They will be called to restore the generations. They will be called to repair, build up, raise up. Some of us can only celebrate the kind of Christmas we don't need by ignoring the rubble around us. Willful ignorance. Not passive. There is passive ignorance that is a part of our coping as a human being. If we were to just take it all of the problems of the world and our senses, we wouldn't get out the bed every day. So there is a, a, a psychological tool that is called passive ignorance. But there are some things that you are willfully ignorant about. You ever met somebody? You know they lying. I had no idea. What you talking about? You had no idea. It's been on the news every day. I'm sitting in your house. Your house is flooded. What you mean you didn't know your house was flooded? I work with kids and parents. I have no, I have no idea. Oh my! I was. I didn't know that. No, you know. You know. Cause I know. I have kids, and I, you know, I'd be like, Lord, what to do? What am I doing with these kids? <laughs> Shout out to all you teachers up in here. Somebody say amen, right? Pay. You and I, we can't have a Christmas that celebrates imperialism. Violence. Subjugation. Capitalistic acquisition. Working ourselves to death. That is not the kind of Christmas we need. We got to recognize there's rubble around us. When we recognize that there's rubble in the backdrop, you can't unsee some things. And we ought to be people whose heart is formed towards recognizing the rubble of the unhoused around us, recognizing the rubble of the abused within our family, recognizing the rubble of the the economic exploitation that we participate in. Because if we recognize the rubble, we're going to get the kind of Christmas we need. Question, are you numb to the rubble around you? What's made us numb? Some of us, you know, watching the wrong, listening to the wrong, you know, hanging out with the wrong. And so they they feeding us Kool-Aid, telling us, Whatever wine you like, I don't drink wine, but I heard they two different <laughs> textures. Kool Aid, you is free, you basically free. You get it, you know, selling your diabetes right over. Just get, take it, please. Wineries, you know, you you gonna pay something to get that fomented for years at a time. Are you numb to the rubble? Who and what is causing you to ignore the rubble? Some of us have no proximity to the rubble around us. 
So we get it mediated to us through people who benefit from us ignoring it. Well, you can't ignore the rubble and follow Jesus. Sometimes Jesus is going to lead you right into the rubble. Why? Because that's where Jesus is. I know some of y'all are like, oh, no, you ought to, you ought to be happy. Jesus is found in the rubble. Because guess where you are? Guess where you will be one day? Oh, not me, Pastor. I've went to Stanford. I've, uh, I've invested. I'm a, I'm a entrepreneur. I'm a venture capitalist. You got rubble in your future because nobody escapes the rubble of life. But I'm so glad we serve a savior who's not intimidated by our rubble. Don't you know that the scripture says that Jesus came to save the people from their rubble, from their sins. And the way Jesus shows up in the rubble is in an incarnatability sensibility, meaning that Jesus just shows up and he, he, he literally springs to life amidst the rubble of our lives. Jesus doesn't come from the outside. Jesus comes from the inside. Lord, have mercy. And when Jesus comes from the inside, he starts to invite you and I to be a participant with him in making the kind of Christmas that we need. And that's why I just want you to know, child of God, that on a day like today where we are calling for peace, you may be saying, well, what can I do in the midst of all of these problems, in the midst of all of these challenges? Well, you can become a gift to somebody. You can become a gift to somebody amidst all of the rubble. That's why I love the text when it says, that there are all kind of things that you and I can be. If I were just to give you a quick recap, I feel a little preachy today. I, I preach a little recap from the text that I just read. And I'm going to put all these things up on the wall. Just in case you can't understand what the black preacher is saying. As he recaps the old black church way. Well, the scripture says that the spirit is upon me. We get the Christmas we need when we embrace that the Spirit is upon you. Then the Spirit has anointed you. Do I have anybody that can say, I feel anointed? The Spirit also sends you. That means that you can't stay where you are. We get the Christmas we need when you can leave this place and begin to proclaim that in the midst of all the rubble, there is some good news to proclaim. That I'm here to bind up the brokenhearted. I'm here to proclaim liberty to the captives. Not just tell you that you're free, but I'm also here to release you from your bondage. That means that I got to organize. That means I got to volunteer. That means I got to go to work. I can't just be a talker for justice. I can't just be a talker for liberation. But I got to do something to make sure that I release you from the bondage of racism, from the bondage of classism, from the bondage of war makering, from the bondage of homophobia, from the bondage of transphobia, from the bondage of depression. I got to release you because I'm getting us the Christmas we need. I got to proclaim the Lord's favor. That just means that God approves of you. Do I have a witness today that can be excited about the fact that God approves me? I am certified. I am certified by God. God loves me. God heals me. God embraces me. I am enough.
enough for God. Somebody shout hallelujah. We get the Christmas we need when we provide comfort, when we provide for somebody, when we give to somebody. We get the Christmas we need when we are called to build up, to raise up, to repair. God, my prayer today, give us the Christmas we need. Uh, save Santa Claus. Uh, save Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Uh, save all them jokers uh, for the United States of America. Uh, but I want a Christmas uh, that breaks the yokes of bondage. Uh, I want a Christmas uh, that brings your family back together. Uh, I want a Christmas uh, that ends every war. Uh, I want a Christmas uh, that defeats racism. Uh, I I want a Christmas that defeats war. I want a Christmas. Give us a Christmas we need. Somebody shout hallelujah. Stand up, everybody. We can make a prayer. And the only way we get that Christmas is if we grab hands with somebody. And we say, Lord, whatever's in my power to ensure that we get the Christmas we need, let it start with me. I'm not a political leader, perhaps I'm not a big banker, but wherever I'm at, I can do these things. I can be a person of peace. I can give, I can bind up, I can proclaim, I can release. If you are boss on a job, think about how you release some organizational pressure. You don't participate in the subjugation of people on your job. Be a person of peace. You're in a relationship with somebody and you know there's power dynamics. How can you be a person of peace? God help us be people of peace. So God, my prayer today, make us people of peace. May it start with me. May it start with the person I'm touching. May it give us an opportunity to show love and tenderness to those in need. And I know you're able to do it. I know you can, I know you will, because you've done it with me. So God, do a peaceful work among us as Christians. May we be a people committed to studying war no more. War in other countries, war in this country, in our neighborhoods, in our family, in our schools. God, may we lean into the work of peace. May that be the gift of this Christmas season. And I pray, God, that you'll do it first within me. Lift your hands real quick and say, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Come on, say it again. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Say it again. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. And so let it be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them this is the Christmas we need.